Hello and welcome to the next G5 Prediction Forum. My name is Tanya Ha. I'm a science journalist and a sustainability researcher and I'm delighted to be your host for today's forum. The next G5 Prediction Forum is part of a suite of online forums that will be held over the coming months as part of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change project. Now some of you will have seen the Bushfire CRC's past webinars in which bushfire researchers have presented their findings. Thanks to the wonders of modern technology, we're able to try something a little bit new today. We're trying a new forum-style webinar. This will be more interactive than a traditional webinar with online polls and the opportunity for questions and discussion, as well as the core presentations from researchers. Now, a brief overview of today's forum. The focus is the Fire Impact and Risk Evaluation Decision Support Tool, or Fire DST project for short. We'll soon start with an introductory video followed by three research presentations and a discussion with a lead end user. Along the way, there'll be online polls and surveys and opportunities for discussion. But first, I'd like, you to, introduce you, I'd like to introduce to you this online environment that we find ourselves in today. The main parts are self-explanatory. You'll see in the center panel, that's where the slideshows will appear. And as you can see, the presenters are at the right of the screen. But I'd particularly like to draw your attention to the box at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. You'll know it because it has a small speech double at the top left corner. Now, this is a place where you can type in your questions and comments as the researchers present their work. So we really encourage you to get involved. And if you're into Twitter, you can also tweet using the hashtag BushfireCRC, which also appears at the bottom of the slide that's currently on screen. Now, do bear with us as this is our first forum using this technology. We hope that we've anticipated and smoothed any potential technical issues, but there might be small delays as we progress. If anyone is experiencing technical difficulties, they can contact the hotline on 1800 733 416. That's 1800 733 416, and tech support will assist. The forum will be recorded and will be available on the Bushfire CRC website in a few days' time. So if you have any colleagues that you think might be interested in today's proceedings but were unable to attend, please do let them know. Thank you to those who've already sent in questions for the presenters. We'll make an effort to address those during the proceedings and some, of course, will be answered within the presentations. Now, it's my great pleasure to let you know who we're going to have presenting today. We have Dr. Kevin Tolhurst, who's a researcher from the University of Melbourne. There's Ian French with Geoscience Australia, Dr. Mick Meyer from the CSIRO, and we also have Ralph Smith, a lead end user from the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia. And we'll hear more from them shortly. But first, we have an online poll. What we'd like to find out from you is how much do you know about the Fire DST tool? Now, tick one for nothing, two for a little, three for a fair bit, or four for a lot. How much do you think you know about the Fire DST project? We'll give you a few more seconds. So far, the, the nothings and a little seem to be winning. So my thoughts are looking at that is that it illustrates the needs for presentations and events like this online. And we do hope that by having this available online, that more people right around the country can make use of the research and the thinking that's now available. Now, before we begin our, to hear from our presenters, we're going to start off with a short video. This video is produced by the Bushfire CRC and it will be giving you a high level overview of the Fire DST project. It runs for around five minutes. Fire managers need to make quick decisions in stressful situations, managing resources to help protect the community. Over three years, the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre has developed a proof of concept software program to help provide this information. The program is the Fire Impact and Risk Evaluation Decision Support Tool, or FIRE DST for short. 
let's see how it could provide valuable new information for fire agencies in the future. This map from Black Saturday shows the perimeter of the Kilmore East bushfire at 7.15pm. The program currently used to simulate fire spread is Phoenix Rapid Fire. Here is where Phoenix predicted the perimeter of the fire would be at 7.15pm. Traditional modelling programs like this only provide one estimate of fire spread. However, major bushfires are very complex and Fire DST allows for this. Fire DST builds on Phoenix to create a much more advanced fire modelling program. As soon as a fire starts, Fire DST can run the Phoenix simulation multiple times very quickly, adding in changes to the humidity, temperature, wind speed and direction that might occur during the day. Fire DST shows the probability of the fire impacting specific areas, taking into account these variable factors. It does not reconstruct the fire after it has occurred. It helps predict the spread of a bushfire and the uncertainty in its location and consequences. Here is the same fire again, but modelled using Fire DST. What makes Fire DST more advanced than existing fire prediction models is that it shows the likelihood of a fire reaching different locations. Let's concentrate on the colours for a moment. The red section is the highest chance of the fire perimeter reaching that area, between 76 and 100%. The dark brown areas have a 51 to 75% chance of being burnt. The light brown section shows a 26 to 50% chance of the fire perimeter reaching that far. The yellow area shows the least chance of the fire impacting. It's possible, but less than a 25% chance. So how do we know this? To get this variability in the fire prediction modelling, the research team has studied in more detail how variations to the weather affect a fire. High resolution models help to understand how the weather interacts with the bushfire and what effect this may have. This all means Fire DST can give incident controllers much more information about the likely impact of a fire than ever before. Fire DST has also enhanced existing smoke dispersion models, seen as the various shades of brown, this information can be used to monitor the air quality, helping to forecast the possible health effects of bushfire smoke on the community. Fire DST can also show how many people could be impacted, as well as what buildings may be affected. New information can also be added as it comes to hand, such as forecast changes to wind speed, direction and humidity. Fire DST will reflect these changes and conditions. This prototype project has demonstrated that it is possible to incorporate uncertainty into fire prediction modelling. Such a program could provide fire agencies with far more detailed knowledge than ever before about where a fire may go and who or what it might affect. Let the Bushfire CRC know if you are interested in advancing this prototype. The Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre. Research to drive change. Thank you, Bushfire DST. Sorry, thank you, Bushfire CRC, for that video. Now, we know that some people were having a bit of difficulty viewing that on screen. That will be available on the website and in the dialog box to the bottom left corner we've posted a link to that video. And you'll also notice from the dialogue box that we have someone joining us from Washington, D.C. So welcome and we're delighted to have someone from so far afield joining to share with the learnings. It's now my pleasure to introduce the first presenter. We have Dr. Kevin Tolhurst from the University of Melbourne. He'll be speaking on Enhancement of Fire Behaviour Project Phoenix. And please do send through your comments or questions via that dialogue box while he's presenting. Take it away, Kevin. Thanks, Tanya. I guess I'd like to present today the uh, work which follows on from working at the previous CRC, looking at Phoenix Rapid Fire. Phoenix Rapid Fire is really uh, a major drive engine for the Fire DST project. What we've done in, in, with Phoenix Rapid Fire is brought together the complex interaction between fire, the landscape, the terrain, the vegetation, and the, the weather 
into a dynamic model that encapsulates something that's quite unique in Australia, which is the spotting process that helps drive the rate of spread of the fire. So part of our DST project, we've significantly improved the convection modelling. We've uh, facilitated the use of upper winds to help drive that spotting process. We've developed ways of testing the, the, the quality of the information that's coming from uh, the Phoenix model using sensitivity analysis and, and coming up with some objective metrics to be able to evaluate something as complex as a fire shape with uh, the, the uh, predicted fire shape. And we've basically also incorporated some elements of fire suppression um, resource travel times into the model. We'll go through that in a bit of detail. So one of the things that we've uh, done is we've developed a model which is effectively a two-dimensional model, but uh, we've added a third dimension, which is this convective uh, strength. What we know in large fires is this convection column really is important to how quickly fires move and how destructive that fire can be. So in Fire DST, we've done that in a relatively simplistic uh, computational environment. So Phoenix is just a, a computer model that models fires, but here we're driving a complex interaction between fire and the atmosphere above it. So capturing that convective uh, process has been a, a major step forward in looking at how uh, potentially destructive fires are. Something that's been important as well, the end users really want to know how good is this model? Can we stand up in a, a court at a co coronial inquiry and say that the information that we were sharing was actually uh, based on good valid science? So one of the things we found was it was very difficult to come up with objective metrics of how to uh, quantify the value and the performance of these models. So we came up with two basic models here. The first one was a, a felt relatively simple area difference index, which showed basically the percentage of overlap compared with the amount of over or under prediction. But we've also came up with a, 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 a Procrustes uh, approach, which basically allows us to look at the shape, the size, the orientation, and the center of mass of the predicted area compared with the actual fire size. And that's really important to people using this model to understand just how accurate the model is, where the uncertainties are. And as we'll hear a little later in the session, dealing with those uncertainties is always really quite important. One of the applications we've found here is that currently in Australia, we use an Australian standard to look at the exposure of, of buildings, of houses to, to fire, which looks at fire in a relatively symmetrical way. So we, we basically largely base our exposure to fire on radiation levels. But we know there's not only radiation, but there's also uh, convective, there's embers, embers which contribute 90% uh, to 90% of house loss uh, involved. And the interaction with the terrain and prevailing weather conditions are not symmetrical. So in the Australian standard where we look at radiation and assume a symmetrical uh, relationship or exposure, we can see now in a dynamic model like Phoenix Rapid Fire, that the exposure is by no means symmetrical because of the interaction of all those complex factors. And we now can come up with a much better idea of where the wildfire interface zone really is, using the prevailing weather at that location, using the terrain, using the local fuels, and looking at hazards from fires that include radiation, embers, as well as fire-induced winds. We've looked at the... Um, use the same modeling process to look at how quickly it takes, how long it takes to get uh, suppression uh, equipment and vehicles and people to a fire. And in the same modeling environment, we can look at that. So in this particular example, we see the red area is the area close to the, the black dot where the fire is. And we can see across the whole landscape how, how much time it would take to get a vehicle uh, to that fire location and what the shortest route would be. And it's not or the quickest route rather, it's not necessarily the shortest route. So I guess summarising where we've got to with this model, uh, incorporating the convection and the spotting process has been a fundamentally important uh, addition to uh, fire simulation. The objective me method of assessing how well these simulations reflect reality has been quite important to justify the scientific basis for uh, the modelling process. 
we've been able to show that the model, now that it's performing in a realistic way, is a useful tool to do things like redefining what the wildfire interface zone really is using this dynamic interaction process. And we, again, we can use the model to help us with things like where will fires occur in the landscape that are going to be most difficult to suppress and how can we change perhaps the way in which we manage those suppression resources to improve our efficiency. That's quite important when we're trying to identify what communities uh, we ought to be uh, providing the best warning to and where the resources ought to um, be located in the landscape. They are major advances to our uh, science as a result of this project. Thanks. And just waiting for me to appear. Thanks, Kevin. Here's my Thanks, face back on screen, show pony that I am. Kevin, thank you for that. One thing that I wanted to highlight is I've gathered that the metrics around this, that's a world leading advance, isn't it? Well, surprisingly, uh, there were no uh, standard metrics for measuring the performance of such an uh, irregular shaped uh, object like a fire perimeter. And so um, we were surprised, I guess, when we went looking that there were no objective metrics. And so that has been a major uh, advance uh, to uh, fire science internationally. That's right. Ah, oh, that's exciting. Um, I have a question that's been sent in from Jamie. Thinking about potential applications in a range of fire management environments outside of the public service, is it likely that Phoenix and supporting data will be made available in the public domain at some point, either as an open source or as some sort of licensed software? Yeah, it, it's a good question because there are actually two components uh, to the use of Phoenix. One is the model itself, which is basically being produced largely with uh, public funds, uh, state, federal funds. Uh, but you also have the data to run it. The Bushfire CRC is currently exploring a way of developing a joint venture to allow us to be able to share the model and the data with other people. For example, insurance companies, power authorities, um, water authorities and the like. So we're, we're working our way through that at the moment. There's been discussions going on. Uh, yes, we're very conscious that we need to be able to share this with a, uh, a lot broader range of people, so including um, local governments, um, consultants, and uh, planning authorities, and insurance uh, companies, for example. You might notice on the bottom of the screen, Ian sent in a question via the dialog box. Uh, he's asking, I presume prediction based initially on hourly forecast data, can you incorporate actual on-scene weather data? Yes, we can, but the problem with uh, on-site uh, weather conditions, it's real time and observation. So it's telling us more about what's currently happened and what's happened previously. What we've found very useful is the, the new uh, gridded weather that's produced from the prediction system from the Bureau of Meteorology. So that allows us to, to look forward. But where the two can be joined together is we can use the observations from the field to see how well the forecast is working. And we can then manually adjust the forecast weather to reflect what has been occurring and the observations that have taken in place. So indirectly, yes, we can use those observed values, but uh, we need the forecast or the predictions to be able to um, look ahead. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, we, we don't know for certain what the weather exactly is going to do in uh, hours ahead, but we, we can use the two together. Mm, yes. Thanks, Kevin, and good question, Ian. Thanks for that. We've also had another question sent in from Nicholas. Um, he writes, my question was in relation to the future availability of fire prediction modelling software such as Phoenix for end users. Are the tools likely to remain in the realm of specialist fire behaviour analysts, or is there a possibility the user base may one day be broadened to situation officers or planning officers? So I think it's a variation on the earlier question that was a bit more open source. Is there plans for, I guess, that availability to particular groups and stakeholders? Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. Uh, look, the um, I guess the question always is: is there's really no restriction on who can use the model? But um, my personal feeling is that you can't use a model like this unless you really understand fire behaviour and you know how to drive it. 
Uh, it's like having a, a, a license to drive a vehicle. You really wouldn't let a four-year-old in charge uh, until it built up some strength and experience to be able to um, to drive the model. So there's absolutely no reason why situation officers, for example, couldn't be uh, using the model, providing they understand fire behaviour well enough. It's because it's got a big red button that you can press and, and get an answer out of, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to give you the right answer. There's a fair amount of skill in making sure that the right input information is going in and the assumptions that are being made are, are, are relevant and uh, correct for the particular situation where it's being used. So I wouldn't want to see it being used by everyone and anyone because you'll end up with multiple answers effectively. It yeah. still needs to be driven by an expert uh, operator. Yeah. So it's not just the software, it's having the expertise and the training to be able to use it as well that's important? That's exactly right. And, and the Bushfire CRC uh, looking at that as part of this joint venture is providing training for people who want to use it. So it's not just a matter of making the software and the data available, it's also having people who can operate it and use it. Another question we've had sent through, will it be used um, for public fire forecast maps? Well, it already is, in fact. Um, so the Phoenix Rapid Fire has been used in um, uh, Victoria and New South Wales in an operational sense. Uh, it was used in the Tasmanian fires in the last couple of years. Uh, it's been used in South Australia and, and Queensland. So it is being used already, uh, but usually in conjunction with a fire behaviour analyst uh, who are probably using a combination of manual uh, prediction techniques as well as the model prediction for the reasons that we've just discussed. But it is already being used operationally. So in Victoria, for example, Within one or two minutes of a fire being reported, uh, the Phoenix Rapid Fire will run and tell you uh, where the fire is likely to be on an hourly basis for the next six hours. So that's using the forecast weather and the um, fire history and the, the fuels and the terrain that are, are pre-stored, if you like. Um, so it is being used, but progressively it should be improved over time. I think um, Jeff K makes an interesting comment that you know, information can be powerful. Is there a potential issue that making the model publicly available could be risky if arsonists start to use it to, well, for worse? Well, I guess that's true. Uh, um, the, the modelling process can be used for operational uh, purposes in real time, if you like, but it can also be used for planning purposes. And, and, and I share Jeff's concern that um, some of this information is almost a how-to manual for arsonists. Where are you going to get the best value for your match? So we do have to be a little careful about um, who <laughs> uses it, that it's used for the powers of good rather than the powers of evil. But uh, Jeff is quite right that it potentially it could become a, uh, um, a weapon rather than a tool. Yeah. Thanks for that, Kevin. I think we have time for one more quick question and a quick answer. Um, Lee is asking, or saying I presume the model is dependent on good vegetation data. In light of poor vegetation data, do we round up um, in a similar way to what we do with the application um, as AS3959? I'm hoping that's meaningful to you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh yeah, look, Lee, uh, you're right. The um, the model will only combine the, the information you put in. So if you don't have good quality information going in, then you're not going to necessarily get a very good answer coming out. So the, the, the fuel, the weather and the terrain are all important inputs. The terrain is usually not so much of a problem, getting the right weather and the fuel. You, you say vegetation, but uh, it's really the vegetation that you may convert into a fuel type. So it is important to have the right fuel information in there, but agencies that are using the model have, are starting to spend a fair bit of effort in, in improving the fuel so they can make better use of the model itself. So there's a bit of a horse and cart thing going on here. Yeah, good to know. And for those who were confused about AS, that's Australian Standard 3959. I should have spelled that out earlier. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Kevin. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our next presenter, We'll now hear from Ian French from Geoscience Australia. He'll be presenting on fire impact and risk evaluation, the decision support tool. Take it away, Ian. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Um, can everybody see me? My, I'm not moving on my screen. But, um, uh, what I wanted to do in this particular part of the presentation was to just delve a little bit deeper into some of the issues that were shown on the video. There were some very interesting graphics we put up, and uh, Kevin has display quite well the information about um, how the um, fire spread 
modelling at the lowest level in Fine Phoenix is actually being used. And um, what I want to do is just step through that. Uh, just that last question was also very relevant in the sense that um, the numerical weather prediction and uh, vegetation conditions that we we're talking about, there is always a lot of variability in there. And as Kevin said, there's a point at which you know we can do analysis of the fuel and the vegetation and the conditions of the weather and put into the model and the point at which we can decide um, how accurate things are. With Fire BST, we took a slightly different approach uh, in that um, we were concerned more with looking at the variability of the way the system actually works. And what I was interested in pointing out was there's a lot of very good work that was done by the Bureau of Meteorology's team, unfortunately not presenting today, but they have a numerical weather prediction software package called ACCESS, which is the Australian Community Climate and um, Earth Simulation System. What it does is it is able to predict for the next 48 hours what the weather is likely to be in terms of temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction. And um, it's able to give you a good prediction uh, in terms of over time. It's currently available at a high resolution of um, 12 kilometres in terms of a grid resolution. And um, the Bureau for us in terms of the research pushed that resolution right down to uh, 400 metres and at five minute time steps. I'll come back to that later in terms of how long uh, some of those simulations actually took to produce. But um, you can also go to the Bureau of Meteorology's website and there is a software called uh, METI available which shows you as a member of the community what their weather prediction system is uh, currently predicting for the next uh, few days. As we talked about as well, we can have vegetation variations. Um, Phoenix can deal with variations in fuel load. It can deal with variations in uh, the fire history that has come through uh, with the fuel. And it can deal with variations in terms of the type of fuel that was there, which is where that question came from before. Um, we also can have in uncertainty, if you like, in terms of the ignition location and ignition time. What we did in Fire DST was we looked at um, the variability that can occur in all these major areas and we're able to introduce variability. In other words, we're able to change these input conditions because they're all digital. We can write computer program which actually change the values. So we can actually say, well, what would happen if um, we had uh, the temperature up by one degree or the humidity down by 1%? We can also look at um, the changes in the vegetation or the changes if uh, we were slightly off in terms of the ignition location and also the ignition time. What we do with all that is, as Kevin said, we run individual Phoenix simulations. We're still not getting away from actually running a single uh, deterministic simulation with one set of input conditions. But I hope you can see that we would probably have hundreds of input conditions based on our knowledge of what may or may not be happening in the environment at the time of the fire. So we can end up with hundreds of simulations of um, Phoenix. And what we then do is store all those and we're able to pull them out into an ensemble, which is what you saw in the video, and I'll show you a couple of instances in a minute. The ensembleizing process is very straightforward. We just are simply overlapping, as described in the video, the um, different fire shapes over the top of each other, and we are showing the percentage overlap of that particular fire. So fire DST itself um, is a combination of changing the inputs and producing a whole lot of different simulations and producing an ensemble output. Just like to add, I suppose, before I go into the next picture is, it is different for people to see an ensemble output because people are used to just seeing a single simulation of a fire spread. And what we're showing in the example that we showed a minute ago in the video for Kilmore was the overlap area of the fire shape. And again, I'll go through what we said in the video, same colours with things. The red area here is 100% overlap, so all the simulations to this point in time affected that area. Uh, we then went down to 51 to 75%. Uh, the orangey colour is 26 to 50%, uh, and the yellow colour is 3 to 25%. Um, this is for the Kilmore fire on um, the um, 7th of February 2009, up until just before the wind changed at uh, 5.47, so we've got the major spread in this direction. Um, I hope you can see that 
it's not one single fire that actually made this up. This is, in, in fact, an ensemble of 33 different simulations with a difference in wind direction of about 10 degrees in the negative and about 10 degrees in the positive um, and some variations in the temperature being up slightly and humidity down slightly just to see what actually happens. And in our research, we were able to locate the actual real fire inside this particular fire shape. So we spent quite a bit of time on, on Kilmore, and um, we also had two other case studies which I want to run through. We had a case study in uh, Wangari in South Australia in 2005, and uh, the fire started just in this little area uh, north of Lake Wangari, and uh, was sort of contained the night before on the 10th of January to a swampy area. and. Everybody thought it was actually contained at that particular point, but it ended up breaking out at three different locations, and you can't really see it in this simulation here. But um, we were able to model those breakouts and actually produce an ensemble that is able to show here that North Shields in here was where most of the um, damage and impact of this fire occurred, um, that we were still able to simulate using the numerical weather prediction software and um, changes in the, um, the ignition times through here that we would have actually impacted on North Shields at about the right time, and um, but only sort of 25% of the simulations we put into this particular ensemble um, shows that, that. Our third case study was actually the most um, challenging and probably for several different reasons, um, but it was back in 2001. Um, everybody probably remembers the Christmas Day fires and uh, all the ring of fires around Sydney at the time. The Mount Hall fire actually started on the 24th of uh, December and jumped the um, Lake Baraganong at about one o'clock in the afternoon on the 25th. And this is an ensemble we produced of this particular fire to uh, 7.30 in the evening. And you can see it's impacted Warragamba and Silverdale. Uh, when we do deep analysis of what actually the ensemble is showing us in the fire simulations, it did actually impact on um, these two locations at roughly the right time. However, probably for the wrong reasons. Um, the ensemble itself was very difficult to put together. Uh, reasoning is it's very complicated terrain uh, through this particular region and that would have affected the fire. Uh, we didn't necessarily, because it was 2001, have enough information about the history of this fire, actually where it really jumped the lake and when it really jumped. So we had uncertainty there about the ignition location and time. Furthermore, we also found that probably there was the, the, the real fire at Mount Hall was still raging across the lake and it was also probably affecting the fire spread here. And at the same time, the numerical weather prediction software was not as accurate in this particular case study as the other two case studies. And so there is still some investigation that's ongoing into um, how we can refine that. But that's essentially why you do case studies. So we have the three case studies. Um, there's a whole lot of work that's been written up on that. If you want to go to the Bushfire CRC website, um, there's a whole series of documents related to each of the case studies and to our final report. But I want to finish off with just a little bit of discussion about well, what can you do with those ensembles. And one of the things that we were able to do at the direction of our end users is look at the population that's being affected uh, or exposed to uh, the fire as it comes through. So here's the same fire that I just showed you a second ago for King Lake in case study one, and it's progression through King Lake West. So King Lake West is this region here. And um, you can see that what we've got is in the tall bar graphs is the amount of population living in parts of the region. And uh, the people that are over the age of 65 in the little bar graph next to it, the people that are under the age of five, and the people that are in need of uh, assistance. And you can see in this area that there's, there's a lot, reasonably large number of population, but there's only a very small percentage in those um, categories that we've put there. In a couple of other areas um, in modelling, there's some analysis was done of um, Marysville, and the population statistics there in Marysville are totally different. But being able to display on-screen graphics, putting the census information in there is essential in terms of being able to show um, what people might be exposed to. Finally, I want to just uh, finish off by saying that uh, the major achievements really were to show that we were able to simulate bushfires in the one to two day time frame, but they are possible to do ensembles. 
and are possible to put variation in there based on variation in the, in the weather conditions, but that really was based on the fact that we had a very good numerical weather prediction software in Access. And um, it is possible that these uh, ensembles produce realistic outcomes compared to what actually happened in those three case studies. And uh, we can look at exposure and also potential impact in terms of building loss um, and how that population in that particular region would be affected. So, Tanya, back to you. Thank you, Ian. And here's my webcam back on, but Ian's webcam sends its apologies. Uh, we have time for just three quick questions that have been sent through, and Ian, I'll get you to, to keep your answers fairly short, yep. um, but still do answer them fully as you can. Um, Ian V has asked, can the user identify Ian's question, how long currently is the run to make the simulations and consolidate them? Um, as planning or situation, we need to do this quickly. Um, yep, certainly we investigated looking at um, doing um, massively parallel runs of Phoenix and uh, we managed to run sort of four si simulations of Phoenix at, at one time and so that runs in the sort of two to three minute mark for each of the individual Phoenix simulations. Um, to merge them depends on how many uh, simulations you're actually putting together. Uh, putting together those 30 that I had there takes about 20 minutes but that's on just an ordinary PC sitting on my desk on my laptop. Um, we were investigating the possibility of being able to um, do things in parallel and I think in the future supercomputers will be able to do this in um, the matter of minutes rather than um, hours. Uh, going back to how long it takes in terms of producing the um, underlying weather, uh, it was taking a whole day on the supercomputer to actually process a whole day's worth of weather at um, 400 metre resolution and five minute time steps so unfortunately that's not really practical at a, a real um, thing now, but you know, five years time, maybe 10 years time, probably there. Okay, and um, Nathan who sent in a, a different question. Nathan, I hope that answers the question that you sent through, which was a similar one on computer power and the challenges of time in these situations. Our next question is from Linda L. Uh, in addition to Ian's question that was just answered, how long currently is the run to make this? No, I think that. Sorry, bear with me, I'm scrolling down. Um, yeah. Can you see that question in? As planning, we need the initial call to be within 10 minutes. Yes, I think we've answered that. Um, Alan. Alan, how are the variations in input parameters selected? Are the possibilities of these variations taken into account or is each simulation given equal weight? Yeah, very good question, actually, Kevin. The, uh, they're all given equal weight at the moment. Um, and that's purely because we don't have um, enough information about the probability of certain variations occurring. Uh, the Weather Bureau probably in a few years' time will put out probabilities in the weather forecasting system inside Access itself. So they might say there's a probability that the temperature will be off by one degree and that probability is 1% and uh, do that throughout the whole of the weather profile that they've given us. And we will then be able to put those probabilities together to actually give a probabilistic view. So in other words, give probabilities instead of just the fire shape, probabilities of each of those individual simulations occurring. Great. Well, thanks for that, Ian. Sorry about the webcam not working. It was in our test. Oh, we miss your smiling face, but hopefully we'll have you when we are talking again at the end of the forum. Yep. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our third presenter. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Mick Meyer from CSIRO. He's presenting on regional and local impacts from bushfire smoke dispersion. Take it away, Mick. Oh, thanks, Tanya. Um, I'll change the, uh, the scale and, uh, and uh, both time scale and dimensions uh, of the discussion in terms of smoke. As you, as you saw in the video, there's, uh, there's no fire without smoke and there's an awful lot of smoke in, in bushfires. And the public perception is that smoke's a, um, a fairly bad thing. Now that perception is not misplaced. Um, the epidemiologists are telling us that uh, it can have quite severe health effects. And um, if I turn the slide on, um, typical figures that you see are an average of about 1% increase in death rate for a doubling in um, 
24-hour uh, average uh, PM concentration, but for susceptible groups, it can go up to much, much higher than that, and there's certainly reports out there for a 75% increase. And the, the health issues that are uh, we see appearing are uh, heart attacks, asthma, uh, respiratory disease, uh, they're, they're acute effects. Um, so the area that we were looking at of coupling into uh, 5DST was one of air quality and regional health. Um, and the questions that we raised are, uh, is this, well, first of all, is the perception of smoke impact um, real? Is it borne out in, in, in actuality? Or is it just um, people certainly, if, if you're uncomfortable in the presence of smoke, then you remember it, but it might not translate into a, um, a, an, a, an acute um, health problem. Um, so we want to know what the, the scale of the, uh, the risk was, what types of fire were a problem caused by various, various sizes and classes. And the third thing we wanted to look at was um, uh, whether we can develop tools to uh, enable these sorts of predictions to be made in the, in the, in the sort of time scale that's useful for via DST. Because the, the issue is of computational intensity applies very much to the, um, the smoke dispersion modelling. It's, at the moment, it's complex and, and slow, and we needed to find uh, ways of or what we need, the, the key parts that we needed to um, to measure to be able to put it into the, a context like 5DST. I just want to say that there was a project we looked at previously, um, uh, which was uh, effect of on firefighters. Uh, that was a, an occupational health and safety one. Um, this this project was dealt deals more with what happens to the smoke when it um, gets dispersed and affects the wider community. First, um, just the the classes of fires. Um, most of you will know these things, but the statistics are not. Um, uh, some of the findings are a bit counterintuitive. Um, most wildfires are reasonably small, and there's quite a lot of them annually. These statistics are in Victoria for about the last 30 years. But there's usually uh, a few large ones, and it's those few large ones that contribute um, most of the fire area. And uh, it varies hugely from year to year. So on a, um, a mild year, it can be almost nothing of the Victorian um, forest area. On a, on a bad year, like um, uh, 2006-07 um, Black Saturday, it can be can consume a, a large portion of the forest. The other sorts of fires that we're concerned about are prescribed fires. Now, they're management fires to try and... Um, uh, uh, offset the uh, the risks from wildfires. Uh, there's more of them a year. They tend to be um, a, a large area of the of, of the state. The average size is reasonably small, uh, but they're they're not insignificant. It's up to maybe four percent of Victoria is the current plan. And in a average year, um, roughly about seventy five percent of the fire area would be from prescribed burns. So we go from uh, most cases where wildfires are a minor problem to the few ex really extreme events where um, they're, they're major problems, where the, in the mild years, the biggest areas are prescribed fires. So we wanted to look at these three classes of fires, um, uh, oh, wildfire, um, a large wildfire that covered um, most of Victoria, or it affected most of Victoria, a very fast moving fire, Black Saturday one, and uh, prescribed fires. Now, how do we deal with this? Um, the, the components of going from fire to risk is shown in this schematic here. Uh, the modelling parts of it on the left hand side where we have a, a, an emissions model, we calculate how much smoke's going in the air, and we run the transport model to decide where it goes, and out of that we find our average concentrations across the, um, the landscape. This left-hand part is the part that takes a lot of time to do, and that's the, the one. Of the, uh, what we were looking at in the project was how to um, get the information we need out of that for uh, operational forecasting. Uh, you couple it with uh, population and the exposure and then add uh, the epidemiological information in and you get a, a some sort of risk measure. So I will, um, how, does, how does that look in reality? Those, those three classes were uh, 
I said the Alpine fire, big fire, covered uh, two months, affected a huge area and a lot of people. Uh, the Kilmore East fire, which was still a massive fire, but was short-lived and uh, a smaller area still covered, uh, affected a lot of people in the Hue and, and the prescribed series of prescribed fires in the Huon Valley in Tasmania that had attracted a lot of public attention, uh, but affected less people. When you look at the, the impact of that, the Alpine, the 2006 Alpine fire was had a major impact, even using the conservative uh, risk factor of 1% per doubling of PM. Uh, that gives us an estimate that probably an additional 84 people died. Now, why that happened was you can see in this slide here, the, most of Victoria was affected high concentrations where the fire was itself, but there was this uh, spur that went over Melbourne where most of the people were and that effect, when you translate that into health risk, that's the sort of uh, areas of uh, where the people, the numbers of people were. still picks up the regional towns around there, but the concentration was in Melbourne. Before it turned to Kilmore East, the smoke was, a lot of smoke generated, it was wafted waft high into the atmosphere when it only mixed down to the ground late in the afternoon, and that was when it was being blown to the north and the concentrations were high, but there weren't many people there. In the Huon Valley, similar, a um, lot of smoke generated. Uh, that little point there is where uh, Geeston is, where the people are, and there's another Huonville's up here. The smoke was dispersed to the south southwest. The Huon Valley, the Huon River goes just up round there and down to the estuary there. Uh, the smoke didn't actually hit to where the people were. So the message is that some fires can be really bad, other, others can, uh, it can be very variable what the impacts are, um, from big to negligible to even less important. So it, mat the, it, it matters. Fires can be severe as a, as a real issue. Um, you need to be selective about which ones you worry about. And to uh, help with that, we were one of the things we looked at was um, what we can do to uh, advise planners um, where not developing, um, addressing prescribed burning of where not to plan. To do that, we inverted the question that where, where, where don't you want to burn? And here's an example of three places in the um, uh, three towns in the Ovens Valley in northeastern Victoria. Uh, what those uh, shadings show is, uh, if uh, for each town, what the relative risk of smoke from a fire uh, would be. So you can see that lots of problems if you're um, near near the town. But what's interesting is if you move out uh, away from it, there's it's not evenly distributed across the landscape, and it's different for each town. But this was this is Myrtleford here. This was Mount Beauty, uh, uh, and this is Harrietville. If you have information like that, you've got a chance, of, um, managers have a chance of planning their patterns of burning a season ahead of uh, where not to burn or, or what sequence to burn in. Um, and the um, we've been able to take this information, oh, okay, and uh, develop it into um, uh, a, a more advanced uh, methodology. So the research outcomes are, we know that smoke matters, it's a big health problem, but uh, it's clear that the if poorly managed, prescribed burning could be a problem. But we know the analytical methods of how to identify the fires and how to implement them in a decision support system. And we're being able to develop some tools that so promise for seasonal planning. And the most important thing is this last one, that out of this, um, uh, this project, we've been able to develop the knowledge of uh, uh, to, to, to move forward into an operational smoke forecasting uh, uh, system for uh, for fire managers for Victoria. So the message I want to leave you is: it makes a problem, it's severe, but it can be managed. Thanks, Tanya. Back to you. Thank you, Mick. We've got a really good question here from Serafina. Is it possible that the mapping can go backwards? In other words, could the public access where the fire or smoke may impact on them, given what has been known at the time? Um, 
Well, in a sense, that's what this prop plot is. Um, it's, it's uh, hard. It's, it's, again, this, these pictures are a bit counterintuitive. What this is is uh, if we put a fire there, um, uh, a re some smoke, but not a huge amount, is could could reach uh, uh, Myrtleford. If we had a fire only a few kilometres out of Myrtleford, if there's a high risk that the, the smoke would hit, reach, reach Myrtleford, if, if the fire was lit down here. Um, there's very little chance that the fire would reach Myrtleford. So the, yeah, the answer is that we can um, use these inverse methods for um, uh, working out where not to light a fire. Thanks for that, Mick. I might leave the questions there for now, just because we'd like to leave, um, to have some time to talk to Ralph before those people who have to leave by 2 p.m. go. Um, so thank you for that, Mick. I'll just progress. Slide so that we're so that I can introduce our final presenter, which is Ralph Smith. He's a lead end user from the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia. Welcome, Ralph. We've heard some really quite complex and detailed research today. And what does this mean for you in your job and the role that you play in addressing bushfire? I, I guess if I could just start with the um, perception on the research as a as an end user is that it's a multifaceted um, project with many complex elements that needed to be integrated, but it's been undertaken by high-quality research with experienced researchers in each of the components. So as an end user, we can be quietly confident that what's being produced is, is cutting-edge research that gives us confidence that we can apply the tools um, appropriately. The other thing I would like to mention, though, is that I need to acknowledge David Yusuf from the Metropolitan Fire Brigade, who was a joint lead end user in this project. So um, he contributed um, significantly to the project as an end user. Excellent. Thank you, David. And he's online, so I'm sure he'll appreciate that too. Uh, my next question was to ask, you know, what benefits do you see for your industry in this research? So looking at the benefits specifically. I guess the, the biggest benefit is that it provides the opportunity to assess the potential bushfire impact onto a community before the fire occurs or even the prescribed burn is undertaken. Uh, the methodology will be available to be replicated, so we're removing personal biases out of the process so that we can get a consistent approach in determining which of the communities are at greatest risk or least risk. Um, the, the project is going to produce a range of outputs. So we've got the regional smoke impact that um, Nick was just talking about. We've got the potential house loss or impact that Ian spoke about. You've got the fire simulation modelling that we've got through um, Kevin's work. And we've got the potential impact on people um, and the age classes of those people. And linked into that is we've got the opportunity to do estimates of the cost of potential damage um, before these fires occur. And then the weather modelling. So understanding the uncertainty of the extreme events um, is now being able to be linked into one combined process. So what challenge changes do you think need to occur within the fire and emergency management sector to take up these findings into policy and practice? So what would the case be to move beyond a prototype model to a system that the agencies use? I guess the the biggest issue is we're going to be moving to a probabilistic modelling approach, um, but acknowledging that that won't be useful for all events, so rather it'll be used for the significant event, that requires a rule set so that we know at what time we should be applying this modelling process. Um, the other um, issue is getting paying for the, the work to go from proof of concept to being able to apply it as a jurisdiction. And that um, is a bit, bit of a problem under the current um, financial situation we find ourselves in the state. Um, the benefit of the system, though, is that it's modular, which allows alternative components to be utilised and input. So. I reckon we've got a really good um, project 
that has a great potential in the longer term. That's good. So, so you can see this research being used over time? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of challenges that we've got, of course. Like, we need to have the jurisdiction fund the next phase and, and the, the budgetary issues um, are a problem. Moving to a probabilistic model is also a change in the industry that we need to probably manage and encourage people to accept. Mm. And we've got a range of what if, what if scenarios that will then be generated, um, which should then give us a better approach and we can build in uncertainty that you can't build in with the um, deterministic sort of approach that we're currently using. Yeah. But another challenge is that impact modelling is a complex undertaking with many inputs and uncertainties. And when you're multiplying uncertainty upon uncertainty, you're increasing your uncertainty. So that has to be factored in as well. And gathering high quality data that is consistent across Australia um, is a fairly complex process as well. And ideally, we will end up with a a standard data gathering process that we can apply to make these sorts of um, national tools more applicable. An important point. We have had a question sent in. Um, how well do you think people can deal with uncertainty? Not well at all. Um, and that's, that's the other part of the problem. So we need to be able to demonstrate um, that all of these tools are reasonably accurate, acknowledging that um, some of the data um, and the uncertainty of that data makes this a, a fairly complex problem, particularly in that rural urban interface where many fire spread models are based on landscape type fires. When you start to get houses built into that um, mix of vegetation, there's some uncertainty about the suitability of the landscape fire spread modelling process. Yes, I, th I think for me, having, having spent my career in sustainability communication, it suggests to me that a really important aspect might be that management of expectations among the public and stakeholders. So is, is that what you're getting at with the understanding of uncertainty? Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I believe that to be the case. I mean, the other part of that uncertainty is that in some parts of the community, they expect the fire truck to turn up to every house, and, and that's not going to happen. So being able to model um, fire impacts prior to an event allows mitigation to be enhanced and potentially survivability enhanced. We've got a question that Peter had sent in. Um, he asked about the risk-benefit analysis of passing on real-time fire prediction data to the public via various communication channels. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we provide um, almost real-time um, data to the community for community warnings. Um, that's currently undertaken within this organisation. Um, but as Kevin said, the simulations need to be assessed to make sure that they are as accurate as they can possibly be before they're made available to um, the general public. So I, I think we're getting better. We're, we're certainly not perfect at this stage, but we're certainly getting better at providing early community warnings to, to people using simulation modeling, modeling technology. Great. Well, thank you for that, Ralph. And having heard from our four presenters, we now feel like it's a good time to revisit our, on, our earlier online poll. So now we'll ask you again about what your understanding is of the Fire DST project. So we'll give you a few seconds to let us know if you... I'm hoping that no one says one, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Two, a little. Three, a fair bit. Four, a lot. Oh, you're a kind bunch. No, no one has ticked one just to tease me. <laughs> and a few seconds more.
Well, great. Thank you for that. We've got our presenters back on screen, all except Ian. I hope we got you by voice, Ian. Oh, we've got uh, the man himself. Thank you. Now, just to wrap up before we go, I'd like to hear back from each of our presenters one by one. Any surprises in that final poll? It, I mean, it looks to me like understanding has shifted a bit, which on one hand sort of justifies us holding this event, and we do thank everyone for attending. But were there any surprises for you as researchers, and do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? So starting with Ralph. I thought it was positive that so many people now um, have have a knowledge of, of the complexities that we've been dealing with. And I guess the take-home message was that hopefully this will become a, a national standard for the analysis of the potential loss or impact on the community. And as the project components are modular, it provides an opportunity to plug into other research or tools. So I think we've, we've come a long way, but we've still got a bit of a way to go to make this a fully operational tool. Good. Thanks, Ralph. And how about you, Kevin? Well, I think some of the questions uh, show a real thirst for having more information so that there can be some more community mm -hmm. empowerment in, in the bushfire arena. I think that's come through a number of the questions. I think what Fire DST delivers is saying, well, look, there's nothing certain in any of this. We need to be able to look at some of the probabilities and risks. And and uh, as was said, it's uh, people aren't, or Ralph sort of mentioned, people aren't necessarily that good at risks. But I think it's a space that we need to be working in. We're, we're well beyond the stage of certainty and uh, assurity, even though I know a lot of people in the community would like to have a, uh, a definite answer from their, their, their leaders, uh, that's not going to come. And I think FI uh, DST helps uh, fill that gap to a large extent, both in the education, but also providing tools to provide information to the public. Great, thank you, Kevin. And Mick, your turn. Um, it was just good, a good re response from the, our audience that uh, they gained something from it. Uh, for me, the um, working in this area was um, really valuable because when we started, we had no idea whether the smoke risk was actually uh, um, real. Uh, certainly, we were able to con confirm that that's the case. And through uh, doing that and through the analysis that we've done, um, developed the techniques that we need to uh, apply this usefully for um, uh, operational forecasting and planning. Um, a lot of this is clearly uh, not intuitive and uh, being able to put this stuff together means that we have now are on the, well on the way to a tool set that uh, means that the smoke can be managed. So the message I'd like to leave with is that sure that smoke is a serious problem but that it can be dealt with. A good point. And finally, Ian. Well, the event got me back properly, which is good. Thanks, Tanya. I was, I was pleased to see that um, the information we presented today uh, managed to get everybody's knowledge level up a little bit about the project and um, where we're heading and what we're doing with uncertainty and um, variability in bushfire spread. I'd like to agree with uh, both Ralph and Kevin that um, it is an area that we've got to be in, involved in because uh, we're dealing with such a variable um, phenomena out there and um, having to say one specific solution is right, it doesn't fit and so um, looking at all possible combinations and I think it is, um, you know, something I'd like everybody to take home is that I think that this is the direction of where research is going, that we're going to be dealing with ensembles, not only ensembles for the fire spread that I've shown you but ensembles for the weather, uh, what is it likely to be next week and so I think that that's really where we're going to be in the future. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Ian. Well, that brings today's forum to a close. Thank you to the presenters, Kevin, Ian, Mick and Ralph, for their insights. And, of course, to you, the audience, for your participation and your questions. We really do appreciate the enthusiasm and interest that you've shown. We do encourage you to visit the website at www.bushfirecrc.com, where, in the coming days, we'll make today's presentations and video available. Related reports and violates can also be found on the website. Do encourage your colleagues who may have missed out to log on at a later date and to watch the forum. We also have a brief exit survey. We'd really appreciate it if people could just take a few minutes to fill it out and provide feedback so that we can improve future webinars. Our next webinar forum will be on extreme fire behaviour in mid-June, so keep an eye on the Bushfire CRC website for details 
or leave a comment in the exit survey if you'd like to be included in the mailing list for future online forums. Now, on behalf of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change project and its partners, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next time.